Thank you for a very inspiring talk. Learning to, learning to live together was at least one time a slogan we had in FEPS when we were thinking what should be a united theme, and I think you touched it very, very nicely there. And as a historian, I would love to debate and discuss a bit compa comparative way the German and Finnish Ostpolitik in the 70s and 80s and how they have a, what, what was the tension between practical practice with our eastern neighbor and the values of social democracy. But unfortunately, we can't go further to history. I think we proceed or rush uh, towards future now. And uh, I introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Christian Krell. Uh, Sorsa Foundation has had, besides FEPS, we have uh, many other good uh, uh, colleagues and think tanks in, in Europe, and I think Friedrich Ebers Stiftung is one of the most important ones, and, and uh, Christian has just started as the new di director of uh, Friedrich Ebers Stiftung's Nordic office, which is based in Stockholm, and I quite often say that Kalevi Sorsa Foundation is your Helsinki office, so to say, and I look forward to continue this good cooperation which we've had uh, with your uh, predecessors. Uh, Christian Krell headed earlier Academy for Social Democracy in Bonn, and he is also a member of this uh, SPD's Basic Values Commission, as well as lecturer at the University of Bonn. Uh, he's, he's done uh, research especially on, on uh, European policy of German Social Democratic Party, the British Labour Party, and the French Socialist Party. Uh, we have just uh, uh, published, uh, the Sorsa Foundation has published an impulse article in our series uh, online, uh, online publication. It's a translation of, of an article uh, of social democratic values in the digital society, and it's available in Finnish there by the door, as well as some other publications other publications, and uh, uh, Christian Krell is one of the authors of that article, and I think uh, he, he's most uh, qualified to introduce the theme of uh, his talk, which is, when I find it, a blueprint for social democratic digitalization policy. Please, Christian, take the floor. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the really kind introduction and thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and uh, as you know, probably we do have some prejudices in Germany about Finland, not just the positive ones Gesine has mentioned, we also have the prejudice that Finland is a dark and cold place. I mean, I'm really happy to realize that this is just kind of propaganda <laughs> that uh, Finland is such a warm, nice, sunny place as well. Um, but I also have to say that it's not the only reason because I'm happy or why I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here because I'm absolutely, absolutely convinced that the questions you have raised, the questions of digitalization, of how we adapt our program to the questions of digitalization is of highest importance for social democrats. And if we want to discuss social democratic principles in the 21st century, we have to ask what they mean in times of digitalization. And I will try to do that um, on the basis, as you have mentioned, on the basis of a paper of our Basic Value Commission headed by Gesine, and a paper I've written with some colleagues. And this paper is probably a very German thing. Um, as you know, we Germans have a kind of tendency of writing long, papers, complex papers about big questions, referring to Kant or Hegel and being happy with that in a way. And I'm, I'm curious to see how interesting that might be for you. Um, I would like to do three things. I would like to describe, first of all, what has happened? What do we talk of when we talk of digitalization? Um, and then I would like to talk on the basic values Gesine has mentioned. Freedom, justice, solidarity, what do they mean in times of digitalization? And I will try to give three examples how we can 
uh, assure that these values are of ongoing importance? How can we safeguard them in times of digitalization? And then I would like to make three concluding remarks. Be positive, be, real, be realistic, and be European. Um, but first of all, what has happened? Um, I won't go into the history of digitalization with you in detail, and I won't do that because, in a way, the history of digitalization is your history. In a way, you have all witnessed how digitalization emerged in our lives. I think, as far as I can see, none of us is a digital native, as probably my three-year-old son will be one day. He grows up with digital technologies. We, we didn't grow up with digital technologies, at least uh, I'm not. We had to wait for a picture to be developed and printed out in a shop. We, we had to go to a library to look up a book. We had to uh, go out to restaurants and pubs to find a partner. We couldn't do that online. So it's a completely different world. And we are witnesses of that massive, of that big change. And some people do compare that to the first wave of industrialization. They say that digitalization is as big as that industrialization. Some people even go further and say, that uh, digitalization is like the invention of book printing. I'm, I'm not sure whether that is true, but I think we can agree on that something, something big is happening right now. And I would like to describe that more in detail with three, three dimensions. First of all, I think it's very important to state that this digitalization is in a way a total phenomenon. It penetrates our life in a way completely. It penetrates our life completely with digital technologies. I'm pretty much sure that every one of us has a smartphone in this room. And it is a highly important part of our daily routine. And even in this moment, even during this um, more or less interesting lecture, I'm pretty sure that some of you use your mobile phones. And this is not that, this is just a description. A digitalization is a total phenomenon. It's touching every aspect of our life. It's touching the way we work, the way we uh, communicate, the way we do politics. Uh, it touches media. And there's some research that very clearly indicates that it also changes the brain structure of humans. So it's, it's omnipresent. It's in every corner of our society. And it has created something that is different from the things we know. It has created a space of flows. That is at least what the Spanish sociologist Manuel Castells has called it. We are used to a space of locations, a fixed set of territory, probably the nation state. And we, and probably especially we as social democrats, are very good in organizing, in structuring, in regulating that space of territory, that space of locations. But there is a new space, a space of flows, where data comes along 24 hours a day. And as far as I can see, we have no really good instruments or probably no experience in shaping and structuring and organizing that space of flows. And what we realize is that in this space of flows, new power structures emerge in that physical space of locations, physical power was, of course, the dominant source of power. But in the space of locations, uh, the, the power comes from those who have the most data and the most sophisticated way to exploit that data. And that brings me to the third point to describe what has happened. A new kind of capitalism emerges around, um, um, around that data. We see a new kind of capitalism evolving, centered around data, centered among, around the exploitation of data. And interestingly, that kind of capitalism started as a very decentralized project with lots of players. And that's what I'm trying to explain with that kind of freaky picture. Um, it started in the early 1990s with lots of players with a very equal set of power. This is the internet traffic in the US in the year 2007. And every one of the quadrants is one platform. You see there are Google, Amazon, Yahoo, and all that kind of platforms. And what you can see is a more or less equal um, pattern. Since uh, the, the size of the quadrant 
depends on the traffic on that platform. And this is now just two years later, it's in 2009, and you can very, see a very clear tendency of monopolization. And this is, again, a couple of years later, this is 2013. So we have a tendency of monopolization within that digital capitalism. So that's to describe what has happened. What are the challenges for basic values in terms of digitalization? Um, I would like to go very shortly into freedom, solidarity, and justice. And for me, the question of, of freedom is in a way, Antti Irina has pointed to it, is at the, at the core of progressive thinking. Uh, it was a tradition of social democrats of the labor movement to liberate people. It was the idea to empower humans to leading a self-determined life. And this right should, of course, be free. Uh, it should be uh, irrespective of class, of gender, of race, of religion. And it should also be, and that's probably the new question, it should be irrespective of, of data and irrespective of algorithms. And the labor movement was strong in organizing a society that allows everyone within the society to live a free life. And I think the internet and the digitalization has a kind of ambivalent effect on that. It can foster freedom, but it can also do the contrary. On one hand, it has enormous potential for expanding freedom, for instance, let's say, for, for marginalized groups within society. It's much easier to, org to, to connect with other marginalized groups. It's much easier to organize a campaign, to, to organize yourself. But on the other hand, you have the big question of big data. Um, and, well, you know, um, you can't avoid talking about Google when you t talk of big data. Google knows that we are here today. Even if you're not locked on at Google at this moment, Google is tracking more than 50 informations about you via your mobile just in this moment. Yeah? It's a highly interesting figure, and I think this is just a tip of the iceberg. In most cases, our messengers, they know much more about our daily life and our daily routine than our husbands, our, our wives do know for the better or worse. And this data is collected by professional contractors. It's exploited by highly sophisticated algorithms. And it is, in a way, fascinating for me that you can predict human behavior by that, by an impressive mathematical precision. And as you know very well, the interest in that data comes from various groups. I would focus on two, it comes from private business and it comes from secret services. And they have different aims, of course, but their interest comes together in one point, I would say. It, it converges in one point. For them, a perfect world would be a world where human action would be fully transparent, where you could predict human behavior completely. And that's a question we have discussed very heavily within the Basic Value Commission. What happens to a society when it becomes completely trans transparent? What happens when we were all naked in a way? And I would say, and Johannes Strasser, our colleague, was very strong on that, and he stated, if we have a completely transparent society, it will be an unfree society. When it is possible to trace back not only click, but every movement you have done, and this is not science fiction, probably also every thought, one is forced to ask, will it be used against me? What happens to that data? And only if it is clear that not every of my actions is public, I have a chance to be free. Only if I can decide what should be public and not, I have a chance to be free. And as you know very well today, we are far away from that. We don't even know in detail what Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., what they collect from us and what happens to that data. So we have, as I can see, massive problems when it comes to, to um, freedom in a digitalized world, but also some answers. Um, you are aware of the importance of data, and there are some interesting guys discussing that uh, as well. And I would like to quote an idea of uh, Evgeny Morozov, the, the, the white Russian intellectual that focuses very much on questions on digitalization. 
so we are very well aware of the importance of data in a digitalized world. You know the talk about data as the new oil, the most important resource in the 21st century. And it might be the case that we end up with just one big company, Google, knowing not only everything about us, but also having all the data on us. And this is, as far as I can see, not a very good perspective if it is just owned by one company. Another scenario would be, and there are uh, problematic angles with that as well, a kind of state ownership of that data. I won't go into that in detail, uh, but I think there's a more promising third model that says that we should have a public ownership of that data that is collected. Um, this is the, 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 that is the idea of Evgeny Morozov. He says that we should have a, a, a regime where data, because it is so important to all of us, should not belong to the state and not belong to a private company. It should be shared publicly. It should be a public good. You know the concept of, of public goods, that there are things that are so important that uh, uh, it shouldn't become a commodity. And that is the idea behind the talk of Yevgeny Morozov on data as a public good, where it can be uh, uh, used by everyone. I won't go into the technical questions of that. Um, let me just continue and looking a bit on justice. Justice, you have mentioned justice, Gesine. Um, and as you all very know, justice is very highly debated within every society. We discuss, is it equality? Does it mean equal outcome? Does it mean equality of opportunities? Is it a kind of distribution based on needs, as Karl Marx has, has uh, stated it in, in, in one place, that is highly controversial. But we are very clear that it has to do something with, con with, with, with uh, distribution. And the good news with digitalization might be that there is probably more to distribute, that we have a growing wealth within our society. At least most uh, uh, researchers state that we will have productivity gains due to digitalization. But the bad news is that not everyone will benefit from that, unfortunately. It might happen that the productivity gains are spread very, very unlikely and that they contribute to already existing inequalities within society. It might be the case that the technological shift will create more jobs in the end, but in the interim we will probably have a rising unemployment. Um, I might draw your attention to a debate we have in Germany in these days which focuses very much on the future of work in times of digitalization and our Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs has a big campaign called Work 4.0 focusing on how we work within the 21st century and they think or the, the, the basic idea is that we need to have a kind of new flexibility compromise between employers and employees within that digitalization. A kind of arrangement not only between states and citizens, but between trade unions, employers and the state. And what they observe is that you have growing demands for flexibility, both by the workers and the employers and by the uh, companies. Um, but often these companies' flexibility requirements do not overlap exactly with the flexibility preferences of their workers. You might think of constant availability and stress and all that kind of things. And therefore, our Ministry for Labor and Social Affairs has called for a new flexibility compromise, focusing, for instance, on flexible working hours, on training, on education, what kind of skills do we need in a ever faster changing economy, that is what the ministry is focusing on and probably we have time to go into that later. Let me go to my uh, last big point, what happens to solidarity within the digitalized age? And to be perfectly honest, I, I really don't know what happens to solidarity because I think solidarity is such a demanding concept. Solidarity is ambitious. If you want to express solidarity with someone, you have to accept that he is part 
of your society, that you are equals, and you have to know that he or she is there. And I am afraid that we are losing a kind of po common public sphere where we could get in touch, which is a problem for solidarity, but which is also a problem for society at all. There's the, the, the big debate, if you follow the questions of digitalization, the big debate about filter bubbles. And what I'm trying to show with that picture, uh, it's, it's a picture I took from Ellen Pariser, what I'm trying to show is that there might be something like reality, that there are the, 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 the bubbles outside. Yeah? I know that there is a controversial debate if there is such a thing like reality, but we won't go into that details. But we accept that there is a kind of reality. But for us, it is highly difficult and even more difficult in these days to get a full picture of that reality. And that is due to that kind of organizations written on the circle. Google, Flipboard, Washington Post, Huffington Post, they all work with algorithms that structure the view that you have on reality. And um, I'm trying to explain that a bit with Facebook. Um, I'm, I'm, I think some of you, at least some of you, have a, have a Facebook account. And when you open your Facebook account, there's a news stream. And that news stream is highly tailorized, tailorized for you. And that is based on lots, lots, lots of things. Here is a, uh, here I just mentioned five. The interest, how are you interested in the person that has posted something else? Um, what kind of post is it, uh, what is your relation to the person, etc. And this is a, a simplification, since Facebook looks around roughly 100,000 indicators to construct your Facebook news stream. So it's, it's, it's very impressive, but it shows you that it is very difficult to have a full picture of the reality as it is, because it is filtered by Facebook, by Google, etc. for you. And if you think of solidarity, and again of what I've said earlier, that solidarity is the knowledge also that there are others, other groups in society, it will be much more difficult to get in touch, to know about the others in society due to that filter bubbles. And I really don't know what to do with that, unfortunately. Um, Another thing when it comes to solidarity might be the question of our welfare state. You have talked about the nation state, Gesine, um, because social democrats organized the idea of solidarity via the welfare state, via the state. And now we have a kind of new capitalism centered around data, centered around platforms. And that new kind of capitalism challenges the concept of our welfare state. And um, I'm sorry for not being more, uh, more creative. Uber is such a conventional <laughs> example. But I, I think it's worth to, to have a closer look at Uber. If you look at Uber, it's the, one of the highly interesting platforms like Airbnb, Amazon, Mechanical Turk, and others that are highly profitable, highly valuable, interestingly, by producing nothing. Yeah. They don't produce anything, they just match information in a very sophisticated, intelligent way. Uber connects drivers with passengers. They, they have not invented anything in the Schupiterian sense of creative destruction. Um, but they are highly successful in connecting information using big data. And that challenges our welfare state for two reasons. First of all, it's highly, uh, highly complicated to tax Uber and platforms like that. We are losing tax money that we, of course, need to keep our public services and welfare, straight, uh, welfare state structures. And it is highly challenging for us because it challenges the regulations we developed during the last decades. And uh, Uber is a good example for that as well. We, we, we developed regulations to protect drivers, but also to protect passengers. And they don't apply for Uber. 
Um, the regulation we have developed over a long period of time, for instance, it protected uh, disabled persons. When you call a taxi and you, you need a wheelchair, the taxi driver, at least in Germany, is forced. He has to take you with him. That's not the case for Uber. Yeah, and it's, it's a very frequent um, um, thing that happens that Uber drivers refuse to accept customers with a wheelchair. So what I'm trying to show is with that simple example that the legal framework we have developed to protect individuals, to keep up our welfare state is highly challenged by the welfare state and by that kind of new capitalism. Um, and we in Germany just discussed, we haven't come very far with that, unfortunately. We have, we were trying to discuss, discuss a new legislation that treats Uber and the other platforms as employers so that the regula re regulations I was talking on earlier uh, would apply for them as well. So my last point, um, and that might be a bit surprising. Um, probably my talk was a bit a typical example of German angst, yeah, of German Weltschmerz, uh, a bit dark, a bit gloomy, but we should be positive as well. I think the internet, the digitalization is a fantastic tool. It's a fantastic tool to multiply participation, uh, participation in democracy, in education, in cultural life, etc. It has the enormous potential to make our life better. But also we shouldn't be naive, we should be realistic. It can make our lives better, but it can also do the contrary. It can increase already existing inequalities and it might lead to less and not to more freedom. And therefore we have to shape this digital area. And I think we don't have yet the proper tools to do that. We are struggling within politics to find the proper tools to shape that digital area. And therefore I'm so happy that you have put the questions of digitalization on your agenda when you think about the program of the social democrats here. And my last point, be Finnish, be German, but also be European. When you think of the regulatory level we need when we want to shape digitalization, the best way would be, of course, a global level, since all the actors I was talking about are global, uh, globally engaged, for instance, Google. Google. But uh, I think that won't happen in the very near future. And therefore, I think we need a kind of clever mix of national and European solutions. And therefore, I'm happy that Ernst is here as well talking about European solutions. If the European Parliament or the European Court of Justice regulates something con concerning the digitalization, it does matter even to Google, even to Facebook. And therefore, it, it sounds probably a bit utopian, but in these days, but uh, I think we need more European answers to the digitalization. And yeah, thanks again for listening, for net, not being with your flip-flops uh, on the beaches. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm really convinced that the questions of digitalization are of highest importance for the future of social democrats. Thank you very much.